I think we'll get started. Thank you all for uh, joining us today for the annual um, John E. Whitmore Memorial Lecture. Uh, the Whitmore Endowed Lectureship was established in 1987 by the late Clara Whitmore in memory of her husband who served on the Board of Trustees here uh, for many, many years. Uh, John and Clara Whitmore uh, were really ver very strong supporters of the community and absolutely loved Baylor College of Medicine. In fact, uh, they endowed the president's uh, chair, which I sit in, and I remember because I, I had to meet, I actually got to meet Clara right before she passed away. Uh, but really tremendous supporters of the community and of, of Baylor. Uh, our speaker today is Eric Topol. He's a practicing cardiologist at Scripps in La Jolla. Uh, he's well known for leading the Cleveland Clinic to becoming the number one center for uh, cardiac care. Uh, there's also a new medical school that he started there, a fascinating uh, model in which to train people in the Cleveland Clinic uh, method and style, which I thought was one of the most advanced and forward-thinking approaches uh, to medical education in a long time. It's, is the tuition still free? It's free. That shows you the Cleveland Clinic prints a lot of money. <laughs> but it's a really brilliant idea. Uh, he's also um, spearheaded uh, the discovery of multiple genes that are, uh, that are, that are responsible for susceptibility to uh, myocardial infarction. And he leads the flagship NIH-supported Scripps Translational Science Institute and is the co-founder and vice chairman of the West Wireless Health Institute. He is professor of genomics at the Scripps Research Institute and the chief academic officer of Scripps Health. He was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences and is uh, one of the top 10 cited researchers in medicine. In 2011, he was named one of the top 100 most influential people in healthcare. And last month, he was named the number one most influential physician executive of 2012 in a poll by Modern Physician in Modern Healthcare. I guess they lost my name in that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> His new book, The Creative Destruction of Medicine, uh, gives us a glimpse of what the future of medicine holds for both practicing physicians and consumers. He was gracious enough to give each of the graduates of this year's class a, a book, and I have read the book. It is outstanding. I think you should all buy it and read it. Is that his little plug, right? Uh, and he's clearly one of the most innovative physician scientists today, and most importantly, uh, Eric's a friend of mine. We've been friends for several years now. We work together uh, on a couple of scientific advisory boards. Please uh, join me in welcoming Eric Topol. It's a real treat for me to join you. First thing I want to do as far as we get into this digital revolution in medicine is to see how many of you are on Twitter, active on Twitter here. A very small number. Okay, you need to get moving on that. Uh, that's where I get my best information. A lot of things I'll talk about um, th this afternoon uh, are actually related to that. So uh, first let me just start off by the digital side of this. Uh, explosion of change in medicine, uh, which is uh, profound, and uh, particularly what happened in the last decade in the zero zeros. Um, you know that now there are more mobile phones than there are toilets or toothbrushes in the world. Uh, and 90% of the whole world's population has access to a mobile signal. In fact, this uh, nature declaration, we've n we really never had a technology other than human observation itself that is as pervasively deployed uh, uh, out in the world is a, a remarkable statement in itself. So our world changed with these little devices. These little devices starting back in 01 with the iPod for music and then the Crackberry months later, which, uh, I mean the Blackberry, Crackberry, now it's known as the Slackberry. Um, <laughs> and of course the iPhone just five years ago uh, and then a prototypic for other smartphones, e-readers and then uh, of course tablets. These devices have been so transformative because we rely on them. In fact, uh, it's not just uh, change w how we do things, but even who we are. And uh, what's really interesting is uh, this book that just came out, Eye Disorder, what it's, what it's induced, uh, our obsession with these devices. And in fact, now we are looking at multiple screens uh, at any one time with our multiple tasks, and we have evolved to this new species of homo distractus, and it has occurred and started at a very early age. I thought this was kind of early, um, but then I saw this, and I said, oh my gosh. Um, and then I, I got, oh, well, even to go back earlier here, um, yeah. Um, so uh, Facebook is the rage right now with the uh, recent public uh, offering uh, last week. And you probably know this, but by August, it's right on target to hit a billion users, just behind the size of 
China and India, and soon will potentially outstrip both of these uh, uh, communities. It's been an extraordinary thing to watch, and it's a, a big part of what is uh, this digital world, because you know it started in 2004, there were zero, uh, and now eight years later, a billion, uh, which is uh, just in itself a remarkable uh, statistic. These four horsemen of the, of the digital world, if you will, uh, are all uh, digitizing us at any moment in time. And in fact, just to give you an example of their effect, uh, there's now over 140 companies that are tracing everything you do on the web, and uh, every retail store, for example, Target, they might even know uh, a woman's pregnant before her family knows, just because of their uh, tagging things, as was uh, uh, reviewed in a recent New York Times magazine. So we are getting digitized, and it's a very pixelated view right now, because it's non-medical. It's, it's about our likes and our uh, con customer relations and our demographics, our social graph, as Facebook calls it. Uh, but this networking impact is profound, as you'll see, and how it's, it's now intersecting healthcare. So the other thing, as I already mentioned, to lead off is Twitter, and that started two years after Facebook, zero, and now uh, has shot over well under 300 million tweets per day. 300 million tweets per day. Not a lot of them are coming from this group, I know, but. Um, <clears throat> so. These social networks are not just a Facebook, Google+, Twitter, but they're worldwide. There's many of them are specific to the countries, uh, like Kataki in, in Russia and um, uh, QQ in China. This has brought people around the world together like never before. And so you know this is, of course, what accounted for bringing together through videos, through emotions and thoughts, the revolution that uh, accounted for the Arab Spring, and also uh, has had a major impact in things like Occupy uh, Wall Street. So this is a power of the people we've never seen before, and it's also now starting to affect health inadvertently. Facebook was not set up to improve health, but here is a boy whose life was saved, according to his mother, when she posted his picture, undiagnosed through two pediatricians, very ill, and, and through Facebook, one of her friends made the diagnosis that he had Kawasaki's disease, and that led to effective therapy, and he's done extremely well. And so now, uh, many patients trust their virtual peers who they meet with like conditions, online health communities like patients like me and Cure Together and many others. And what's interesting about this is uh, how many physicians even know that these online health communities, which are immensely popular, how many even know they exist? 11% in a recent poll of physicians even knew they existed. No less that many of their own patients are using these as a key way for guidance about their chronic uh, health conditions. Now, what is all happening with the ability to have all this data, and we'll get into genomic data in a little bit too, because that's contributing, and sensor data, but what it's all doing over time is creating an immense uh, flood, tsunami of data, and we're in this zettabyte era. So what's amazing to me is to think that all, from the beginning of civilization to 2003, there was only one billion gigabytes total of data that had been created. And then, now you're seeing zettabytes created at least uh, on one or more on a yearly basis, this plot out to uh, 2020. So that brings up supercomputers, the ability to process this data. And you know, um, the IBM Watson supercomputer can process two million pages of content in three seconds. I don't know any physicians that can do that. I, I've met a few who think they can over the years. Uh, but what's interesting is that could save a life. Supercomputer could, keep, could process more data. Why don't we all have the capacity to connect with a supercomputer on challenging patients? Well, uh, WellPoint, one of the largest insurers in the US, has already done that for complex patients. And uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering is working with uh, IBM Watson for the, to deal with the genomic data and the clinical diagnosis and management of patients with cancer. That's just a program that just started. This was last week's uh, cover of the, of the New Yorker. And just to bring up the issue of cloud computing, if we didn't have this, we wouldn't be able to deal with this ginormity of data. And now everything's in the cloud, all these different clouds to, to, to uh, try to assimilate. 
And what's interesting is the Thousand Genome Project, a very large NIH-sponsored project of um, uh, more than 1,000, actually 1,700 genomes, they're being stored, the data, in the Amazon cloud. Talk about convergence. And then how about this uh, article, the cloud will cure cancer. I don't know about that, but it's kind of interesting to make that declaration. So the cloud is so big that now it's the check is in the cloud. <laughs> and how do you like this one? It was much nicer before people started storing all their personal information in the cloud. So now let's bring this together because this is this digital era all happening in the last 8, 10, 11 years. All of this happening so fast. And so you have the cell phone, 1973, purchase of the computer, a couple of years later, internet's been maturing over this 15, 20 year period, but then rapid fire, digital de uh, mobile devices, sequencing, social networks, cloud computing. And this acceleration of technology is what I think has set up this remarkable great inflection of medicine, which we're about to see happen, if we let it happen. Uh, and if we don't let it happen, it will be ultimately driven by the consumer, by the public. Um, so just to give an example of the world changing, uh, how about books? How many here only read uh, books electronic form? Okay, that's interesting. How many only read books uh, if they're hard copy? Yeah. How many don't read books? No, no, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this is, um, so this is a changing world. There's a lot of Luddites in this group. I, I get the picture. Um, any rate, I still like hard copy books too, but it's interesting. Uh, this uh, is the story of uh, uh, Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter, who in the last century uh, really was the one who popularized this term, creative destruction. And the point was, in order to go from an old economy to a new economy, what he uh, really uh, thought was vital was a radical uh, innovation. And that's what I think needs to be applied in medicine. We now have these new tools uh, and that we can achieve this. So what's interesting is I did my cardiology training at Johns Hopkins. And I know several of you here had some heritage at Johns Hopkins. And this Welsh Medical Library, I kind of lived in that library. And you know what happened to this library? January 1st this year, it was closed because nobody used the library. So what you can say is our world is being schimpatered. I'm using the, uh, the verb now, but this is kind of the Welsh Medical Library is kind of the example of how rapid things are changing. Who would ever have thought the second largest medical library in the United States would be shut down because of the digital revolution? And uh, speaking of schimpater, who is a hero of mine because he's so big on, he was so big on this radical disruption. Uh, I was looking at The Economist back in March, and I always read this column first uh, each week, and it says, now for some good news. I said, oh, this will be interesting. And it was really the best news, because I had no idea this was going to happen. It was a review of the book. And it said, a godsend for those who suffer from Armageddon fatigue. So that really made my day, I have to tell you. <laughs> and I'm hoping that will encourage the imminent graduates to read this book when things settle down uh, in, the, in the times ahead. So this digital world has been in a separate orbit from the medical world. The medical world is very sclerotic and doesn't want to have any change. But eventually, uh, this, this coalescence, convergence, has to occur. It will occur. It's hit every other aspect of our lives. And when that happens, we have a new capability. That capability is digitizing human beings. So we haven't been able to do that medically, but we will be able to do that in the future. And in fact, many of these tools are starting now. So that, what that does is take us from where we are today in medicine, which is functioning at a population level with mass screening, mass medicine giving the same drug for the same condition to all people, uh, clinical trials of enormous populations, and, you, and extrapolating those results to treat all patients, even though maybe one in 100 or three in 100 are actually benefiting, to an individual level where we know all what it is essential about that person as far as their health or medical story, and we fashion, customize, uh, individualize the care or prevention. We didn't have those tools, and they're starting to now be developed. This whole area started of individualized sensors uh, in the health and fitness space. As you know, with the Nike uh, Plus shoe, 
uh, a sensor in the sole of the shoe, and then these various wireless accelerometers, like uh, the um, Fitbit and uh, the Direct Life Jawbone Up, and most recently the Nike Fuel Band. I, I actually recommend using these in a lot of patients because it gets them to move and get their 10,000 steps per day, which is not easy to get, by the way, if you ever track that. And they're fun because they start to beep or have lights go off if people are sitting around too much, and that's a good thing. We need people to be a lot more mobile with these mobile wireless accelerometers. Now, this is an interesting device. Has anybody used the Zio sleep monitor? Okay, no one. Has anybody ever heard of it? Three people. Interesting. Okay. Well, it's been out for two years, and it's got really good reviews in various, like the Wall Street Journal, New York Times. But what it is is a, uh, a home electroencephalogram. Okay, so you put this headband on at night. It's very comfortable, and it talks to your phone or to the clock, and it tracks every minute of your sleep what phase of sleep you're in. And this is the night of my sleep. The orange bars are, are awake time. Gray bars are light sleep, which isn't worth much. Then you have the uh, dark green, which is deep restorative sleep, the best uh, stuff. And then you have um, also REM, uh, dream sleep, in light green. So I started using this in, uh, um, in, the, uh, on our, uh, in, at our home. My wife is a night owl, so she comes uh, to bed uh, after I, I'd gone to sleep. And she looks at the clock, and she says, Eric? I know you're awake, and I want to talk. <laughs> so um, if you use this thing, I want to warn you about that, folks. It's not just about sleep. It's your brain waves being displayed. OK. Now, why is this useful? Because this is prototypical where we're going to go in medicine. Now I'm competing with my peer group of thousands of people who have this device that they use each night. And I can try to become the best sleeper with the best ZQ score <laughs> and have the best REM sleep and restorative sleep. And imagine if we start doing that with glucose and blood pressure and weight and activity with this free digital infrastructure of social networks, which is basically leveraging that capability. Isn't that remarkable? So I could find out you know, who would have ever known how I sleep compared to people in my age group. Very interesting. Now, this is starting to be the new, new thing among athletes, because they found three NBA teams, by the way, using uh, a sleep monitoring every night, because they found that that correlates with their performance, which is really interesting. It's a lot better than drugs, of course. And so that's a good thing. And so we'll see how that trend continues. But uh, it's been a very interesting one. And recently, that's led to a compilation of all the pro athletes and their sleep patterns. And what's really interesting is the king of sleep is uh, LeBron James. He averages 12 hours a night, 12 hours a night. No wonder they can't win the playoffs. Um, and what's interesting, too, is the person with the lowest sleep among all pro athletes is Tiger Woods. And I won't comment further about that. Now, these, uh, these sensors now are going medical. So I don't know if you've been using them, but now you can get blood pressure. And I have found this is remarkable. I can't get my patients to chart their blood pressure and send them to me, and they have to write it down. But when it's pressed start on their phone, oh my gosh, hundreds of blood pressures all of a sudden. And what's great is I don't have to look at them because it's all processed. And I get a graph. They get a graph. And they can track it. And it's remarkable to see the same with glucose. So these are really big uh, forward steps uh, using the devices of today, which still require some activity as far as pressing a button. This was a big story of convergence that happened just over a week ago. Apple stores now with an app ad so that you can take your finger stick, this is the IBG star, connect to the iPhone, and it, it charts, archives, and of course sends all your blood glucoses. If you happen to be a diabetic or, or a pre-diabetic, that's a big, when Apple stores are selling diabetic accessories, you know the world is changing. And then, of course, you can have continuous glucose sensing, uh, and that's uh, something that hopefully will get much uh, more uh, practical over time. You can wear a sensor for a week or two, but it would be nice if these were really inexpensive and, of course, talk directly to one cell phone. This is a device uh, which is really interesting to take your phone and turn it into getting an electrocardiogram. Have you seen that device? You haven't seen that? Maybe I should show it. I'll just take a second here. 
So here's the screen. I'll put the sensors in the back, I'll put my fingers on, make a circuit with my heart. And you probably can't see that in the back, but in a second, you'll see my li live cardiogram. And what's great about it is you can just take those sensors and put them directly on the chest and get all the precordial leads. So that's just, when you see something like this, especially if you're a cardiologist, you say, whoa, the world is changing. And what about the Holter monitor? Invented in 1949 by Norman Holter, and it didn't really change until recently. You had to have these wires. You couldn't take a shower. You couldn't exercise. You're lucky if you get 24 hours of recording. Now you have a little Band-Aid you can put on for two weeks that's sent to the patient in a box and then sent back. It's the Netflix of heart rhythm monitoring. <laughs> <coughs> and then, of course, there's this wireless sensing capability where all the vital signs come through a wristband to one's phone. Are you ready for that? You check your email, you're surfing the web, and now you're looking at your phone and seeing all your vital signs? Yeah. And here's what it'll look like. Um, but it's not playing the video, but that's okay. So that'll be on your phone if you'd like it to uh, next year. And this is a, in the current wired issue. This is the watch of the future. It's kind of interesting. Uh, it says 2027. I don't think it's going to take that long. It's got uh, on it a pollen count, uh, radon level, heart rate, blood glucose, a cloud score. You probably don't know what that is. Uh, cholesterol, Red Sox win percentage, and the S&P 500, okay? But the point is, this is going to be your watch, if you use a watch. If you don't want to pull your phone out and you just want to look at your watch, you want to see everything about yourself, digitized human being on your watch, and you just pick the parameters. We, we can do all this stuff now. It's just a matter of connecting some of the dots here. So if you're a dermatologist and you have patients uh, who just take pictures of their skin lesions, and then get a text back whether they need to have a biopsy or not, that's going to save you a lot of trouble. You're going to have start having a lot less need for doing biopsies when it's done through an algorithm from a photo done by the phone. And then there's these digital tattoos, these, these um, skin chips that can be peeled off so they're not a permanent tattoo, and now it can sense muscle activity for someone with Parkinson's or can be used to get a cardiogram or used to, used to, be, to get brain waves. That looks like a digitized human being, doesn't it? Um, you can digitize the breath to pick up an asthma attack before the breathing before it happens, or potentially to use the breath uh, digital uh, information to predict whether there, there's a presence of cancer, perhaps as sensitive, as sensitive as a CT scan. And you can gamify these things once you have the ability to digitize them, like this uh, whole ability to gamify uh, asthma uh, using an inhaler. So, if you're an optometrist, watch out, because now you can get for $2 from Netra, an MIT spinoff company, uh, an ad to the phone, which will refract your eyes, and then send the text to get your glasses made for $2. Why would you go to an optometrist when you can do this? The power of a portable super, uh, not a super, a, a mini computer, not a supercomputer yet. But the whole idea is, uh, for example, this technology of being able to uh, digitize the retina by an implant and be able to restore vision uh, with a combination. This is a st recent Stanford paper in Nature Photonics uh, uh, using a, a combination of, uh, of uh, specialized glasses and a retinal implant. And things like this have already been used recently to restore vision in a few individuals who were blind uh, in the UK. And then just last week, this was particularly striking. This is using the mind, this is digitizing the brain to be able to just think in a woman who is paralyzed uh, to be able to have a robot bring uh, uh, the water, uh, a drink, uh, to her. Really quite striking. If you haven't seen this, it's worth taking a look at the video, uh, Nature, or the coverage that was extensive last week. So that's the digital uh, side of things. Now let me just quickly turn to the genomic side, because basically we're all just about trillions of ACTGs and zero and ones. That's what kind of tells the story of each of us. And this whole area has been revolutionized as of the release in February by a company that uses nanopores. And so instead of those very expensive sequencing platforms, which you have at one of the world's uh, finest genome sequencing centers here at Baylor, uh, that, and we have a uh, much less number of these uh, in, in, at Scripps, but instead of what uh, is used today, theoretically, these nanopores can read uh, 
uh, base lengths of thousands of uh, bases instead of hundreds uh, and tens of thousands, in fact, and do it extremely rapidly. Uh, so the DNA getting to this nanopore could be done theoretically. It's been announced that a whole human genome sequence could be done uh, uh, at, um, in a, within a 15-minute time frame. That's talking about a diploid human genome of 6 billion bases. 15 minutes. Pretty remarkable. And it looks like this, and it goes right to your laptop, and uh, it doesn't require sample prep. It's actually pretty uh, a formidable jump in the sequencing world from where we are right at the moment, if it all pans out. There hasn't been any publications, and there's multiple nanopore companies, and there's even improving technology to use graphene instead of the current nanopore uh, types. But it's very exciting potential advance. Now, why is this so important? Because even today, some people don't realize how, how medical sequencing is having a big impact. So I don't know if you're familiar with this case, but this is the first uh, individual whose life was saved through sequencing. It was an exome sequence, but nonetheless, Nicholas Volker, who picture here, age five, was about to die in Milwaukee Children's Hospital, the Medical College of uh, Wisconsin, and he had had 100 operations. He had been in a hyperbaric chamber and was basically uh, continually septic for almost two years in the hospital. And uh, at the, almost at the last moment, the lead pediatrician on the team said, why don't we seek Nicholas and see what this is because we have no idea what this illness is that he had. And so they did and that led to uh, a specific gene mutation diagnosis that had never been documented in a human being in XIAP. It led to a, uh, a cord blood transplant and this is Nicholas Volker at age 7, perfectly healthy, cured of an idiopathic illness. So that's a great story and now take this to your center which is now had an international impact, the Beery family, who came here to have sequencing done at the Baylor Sequencing Center. The twins, Noah and Alexis, pictured here, had a, a horrible movement disorder, were severely disabled. And uh, this sequencing led to the specific mutation diagnosis as well as to the appropriate therapy. And now these twins are incredibly active. They're actually uh, scholar uh, athletes, and it's really pretty remarkable. Then there's the story of Michael Snyder, head of genetics at Stanford, who had a large team and published what's now called the snyder Ohm, which is an interesting panoramic through across not just sequence, but as you can see here, it also included uh, the uh, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, autoantibody, and done serially, gene expression serially, 14, 12 times over 14 months. And what's interesting through this feed which just reporting that you could do it be one thing, but actually during the midst of this, Michael uh, actually developed uh, uh, two different viral infections, the second of which uh, with RSV was associated with a big jump in his fasting blood glucose from normal levels to 140, 150, also associated with very high glycohemoglobins. And that led to a radical, rapid uh, lifestyle change, but interestingly, it cropped up soon after a viral infection and during the course of this, this deep dive into his omics. Now, what we're starting to understand is each of these illnesses, these chronic conditions that we generally call, for example, type 2 diabetes, has multiple molecular phenotypes. Here's the 38 common loci associated with type 2 diabetes. And what's interesting is several of these have been uh, uh, had targeted sequencing in, in large numbers of individuals and rare variants in certain uh, genes such as the uh, melatonin receptor, uh, one of these uh, important uh, uh, loci, uh, also in uh, a couple of the ion channels have been associated with threefold or even sevenfold risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And so this story about the rare variants which were only now, this is last week, science, two major papers about rare variants, were only now through sequencing in large numbers of people, understanding the importance of rare variants, not just how frequent they are, but how they can be associated with high penetrance or high risk of developing susceptibility for many of the most important conditions affecting public health. And so this uh, is a really informative era going forward. And it isn't just, uh, uh, about what has been known before about particular nucleotide polymorphisms, but really getting into rare variants 
of structural uh, types of copy number variants, insertions, and deletions. And so now let's use uh, this point uh, of sequencing to talk about how it has radically changed our approach to cancer. And certainly that is uh, striking. And it's not just a war on cancer, uh, but perhaps better named a war on mutations. And so this is a story of malignant uh, uh, metastatic metal melanoma, which uh, is almost uniformly fatal within a year of diagnosis. What's interesting is over 60% carry a driver mutation in the gene BRAF. And by targeting that specific mutation with a drug, uh, individuals like this, this is quite typical, 85% have this type of response. A pill given for two weeks, you see the tumor burden here in this PET scan, and then no detectable cancer within two weeks in 85% of people. And that led to this drug's approval in a very fast uh, time frame. Similarly, here with metastatic uh, basal cell carcinoma, two weeks with a hedgehog pathway inhibitor, uh, the driver mutation in this particular condition for most of the people with uh, basal cell carcinoma and uh, complete uh, 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 abolition uh, of the uh, uh, no evidence of cancer remaining in their subsequent scan and another very rapid drug approval. Last week it was reported that the ALK, the gene ALK inhibitor, uh, crizotimnib, which was a drug that was approved for a non-small cell lung cancer, but now is having a, a striking effect in pediatric cancers, particularly neuroblastoma, a common pediatric uh, cancer. And this is an example of a girl who had failed all the therapies for neuroblastoma, but was given a drug directed at ALK, which turns out to be a very important uh, driver mutation in most kids who have this frequent uh, malignancy. This is perhaps, to, to me, the future of clinical trials. This was announced just last week, and it is a trial done in Colombia, just starting. Uh, sponsored by the NIH and then the manufacturer of the drug, uh, the antibody, monoclonal antibody, uh, at Cronezumab, and uh, also with Banner Health, a uh, Alzheimer's Institute uh, in Arizona. And what's interesting about this is we have never been able to prevent Alzheimer's. In fact, none of the drugs that exist today really have any effect in people who already develop even mild cognitive impairment, no less Alzheimer's. But to be able to pick 200 people who have a PISA mutation in the presenilin 1 gene, which is, uh, has 8,000 people in Colombia that in this very large extended family that carry this, uh, this mutation. And to specifically uh, give a placebo control in just 200 people watching for the surrogates within two years, which could reliably say whether the disease uh, progression has been arrested with a drug that has a marked effect in in binding up amyloid. So that'll be a really interesting trial. And then, when this is done in a very highly specific way, can that be extrapolated potentially to the broader population that don't carry one specific 100% chance of developing Alzheimer's by age 40, 45 with this particular mutation? So what about pharmacogenetics? This doesn't require sequencing. It requires sequencing to find out the variants, but then we can apply them. So for example, at Scripps, Every person who is getting a stent gets genotype for whether or not they will respond to clopidogrel. Now a generic drug used to be Plavix because at least a third of people cannot metabolize this inactive drug. And they have a risk that is at least threefold to develop clotting of their stent unless they are even given a, a, a much higher dose of clopidogrel, perhaps even as high as three times the normal dose or alternative drugs like Prasigrel or Ticagrelor that are available. So this is highly actionable information and, of course, very high stakes. This is a, a very gory picture of the Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which can be induced by the drug carbamazepine, Tegretol, very frequently used drug for uh, various neuropathies, seizures, and even uh, 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 depression and migraine. This drug has a risk of about a 1 in 1,000 of inducing Stevens-Johnson syndrome. And that risk can be completely uh, picked up by a genotype as a function of this, uh, this is now in the European uh, ancestry people, a 26-fold uh, approximately risk of Stevens-Johnson. And many of those cases are fatal, by the way. Now, in the United States, do we do any genotyping for someone who gets Tegretol, carbamazepine? No. But in Taiwan, you can't get this drug unless you first have 
uh, uh, genotyping to make sure that you're not at risk for Stevens-Johnson syndrome, syndrome. So what I'm trying to convey is we're not even using information we have today in the real world, which is really unfortunate. Now, this is a really interesting slide of the top three drugs in the United States. Top three drugs, 2012. And each of them are about nine or eight billion dollars, and they're all TNF blockers. Now, TNF blockers that are directed specifically, excuse me, uh, against rheumatoid arthritis and to a lesser extent psoriasis. You know these three drugs. What proportion of patients respond to these drugs? Anyone want to guess? These are very expensive drugs. What proportion actually clinically respond? Anybody? Surely we must have some rheumatologists in this audience. 40 percent. All right, that's the answer. We spend 27 billion dollars a year for only 40 percent response. Why are we not doing sequencing to find who are the responders and the opportunities that would then create uh, for new drugs that are people who are TNF inhibitor resistant? That's an incredible opportunity that no one is jumping on. So this is really interesting. This brings up Moore's Law. That takes us back to the digital side of this story. This big jump, and you know Moore's Law, log plot here of the transistor count. And then you see, uh, of course, sequencing. This is the Moore's Law amplified. The yellow line is the cost per genome. It's well outstripping Moore's Law, or if you look at it by the mega base of DNA sequence. Well, now we have a new thing, uh, a new re revelation. Instead of Moore's Law, we have E-Room's Law. You know what that is? That's Moore's Law backwards. Okay, you're probably not into pig Latin here, but anyway. E. Moore's Law, which was coined in this article, is a striking plot. This is the number of drugs that are developed over time per, per billions of dollars, a log plot. 80-fold reduction over time. So just as sequencing and transistors are going one way, drug development success is plummeting the other. It's because we're not using the tools and the right methods. I've given you an example of some very uh, exciting opportunities like Alzheimer's, but we're not doing the things that we should be doing, so for example, with TNF blockers in, in autoimmune diseases. Now, the other point in the genome I wanted just to touch on was the microbiome. I know you have significant efforts here uh, at Baylor, and this is the uh, cover of the current issue of Scientific American. I know you don't look at that magazine because that's kind of not scientific enough, I know, but anyway, it's your inner ecosystem. Bacteria outnumber your own cells 10 to 1. In fact, by genetic material, thousands to 1. Now, this ultimate social, ultimate social network, I thought that was kind of a cute term. These commensals that live with us, which are basically not just defining uh, our gut and all aspects of our body, but they are having a critical role in susceptibility to disease. And we're just learning about that. And this is a fantastic review article in Nature Reviews Genetics last month, if you haven't seen it, where it goes through all the data uh, for various things like obesity and asthma and where the microbiome appears to be having a very significant effect. Well, in last week's uh, Nature was a great review of diabetes, both type 2 and type 1, and the influence of the microbiome on that. So, for example, particular bacteria, uh, a bifidobacterium, uh, which is critical to have in your gut, if there's a low uh, count or is absent, the chance for particular lipopolysaccharides to get into the uh, gut and then uh, uh, have all sorts of uh, uh, toxic effects at the liver, adipose tissue, and muscle level is ex extraordinary. And then these segmental uh, filamentous bacteria are very protective and interact with T cells uh, to prevent autoimmune uh, 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 type diabetes. So this is really an important area. And only through the sequencing uh, revving up could we even get a handle because of the immense amount of genetic material that's in our microbiome. The last thing I want to uh, touch on as far as this creative destruction is this, the stethoscope. This is the icon of medicine. Uh, you know, this is, uh, of course, what anytime you see a picture of the doctor in the hospital, it's got to have the stethoscope in the pocket or around the neck. Well, that's going to uh, be put aside because now instead of the, the stethoscope in the pocket, you can have a high resolution uh, pocket ultrasound device. And this device is pretty striking. And unfortunately, because of glitches we had in the uh, 
uh, laptop uh, technical. I can't show the videos, but this is what you would see one minute taking the uh, ultrasound probe onto the chest. And I do this as part of a physical exam. And why would I listen to the heart when I can see everything in just a very short period of time? And here, alternatively, that was a healthy heart. Again, sorry that for inability to show the videos, but this is basically uh, a, an individual with cardiomyopathy. All this can be acquired, including color uh, Doppler, uh, within a minute or two in a rapid uh, sequence in a physical exam. And that can not only save this 20 billion echocardiograms done a year in the United States, 20 million, excuse me, echocardiograms, a lot of those could be preempted by being part of the physical exam. Talk about cost saving potential in addition to sharing the information with the patient directly. Now what about bringing this stuff together? This is a sign about heart attack prediction. We can't do that. We have no way to predict a heart attack. We can, saw, we can see somebody on the street who it looks like they're a walking heart attack, but that's not exactly a very accurate prediction. And so our problem is we don't know when the crack in the artery is going to occur. Uh, that crack, which has become significant enough, which would then lead to a clot. You can't have a heart attack without a clot. So just having a crack, okay, that's one thing. But when that clot forms, that's when there's cessation of blood flow. So this famous story, you'll recall, of Tim Russert back in 2008 when he suddenly collapsed at the NBC studio in DC. Uh, this, of course, was uh, very uh, um, much representative because he had had a stress test just a few weeks before that was completely normal. And then he has a very large plaque rupture clot in the left anterior descending artery, which, which was found at autopsy. Now, this, of course, is the story. So frequently, we either have stress tests that are normal, and then the person has a heart attack subsequently, or they come to the emergency room with chest pain, they're reassured that they have no heart attack, and then they do have a heart attack within days. This is an article we just published in Science Translational Medicine, and the window to the risk of heart attack appears to be the circulating endothelial cells that are shed from the crack before the heart attack. And these cells are distinctly morphologically different, as you can see here, compared to what the much more rare cells uh, uh, that you might see in a healthy uh, individual who's even age matched. And these cells have multiple nuclei. They come in clusters. And this is the first time we could not only demonstrate the distinct morphology, but now we're sequencing these cells. And we found a very highly specific gene expression signature, which could be used in a blood test. And so someone in the emergency room could come in and have chest pain, and they don't have any uh, troponin or CKMB elevation, their cardiogram is normal, but we could say they have a heart attack that's percolating. And that, I think, would be a very important thing to then uh, use potent antiplatelets, make sure they work through platelet function testing, perhaps genotyping, and that could change the face of uh, some protection or prevention of heart attack. But why don't we have sensors in our body? We have them in our cars. Why don't we have them in our bodies? And we will. That's the next big wave coming, which is embedded sensors. And that's then we can really get into digitizing human beings. So this is a Stanford-built microchip that's put into the blood that can put the blood under continuous surveillance for whatever you want. And we're working with, one, uh, with a nanosensor that's even smaller than this, smaller than a grain of sand, with a group at Caltech. But then you have the sensor that's seeing the gene expression signature, the DNA signal, and then it talks to the cell phone, and you get a special ringtone heart attack. <laughs> or the first ringtone of the first cancer cell that's been spot in the blood. Talk about um, amazingly sensitive, and that's where this is all headed. I know you think that's crazy, but this is technically feasible now. The only question that remains is how long will the sensor last? Is it a month? Is it a year? Obviously, if you're putting in a chip in the blood, a nanochip in the blood, you'd like it to last for a long time so you don't have to keep doing this on a repetitive basis. But again, that's bringing all this together, genomics and nanotechnology and, uh, of course, the wireless sensor and the smartphone, which is kind of the hub of all of this. Last thing I want to touch on uh, before we wrap up, and that is about the uh, way this changes the information asymmetry. Today, physicians and the medical community acts, act as if uh, this is doctor knows best. This is the world of paternalism. This is the equivalent of the high priest pre-Gutenberg. That's what we are. 
And let me give you some data points to reflect that and why that has to change, and it will change. This is the number of physicians in a Wall Street Journal recent uh, report who use email with their patients for any reason. Only 32% of doctors are, uh, use email to their patients in this country. That's pretty striking. I mean, most of, <laughs> I've been using email with patients in, since the 90s, and it's now 2012. This one is, this has really got me. When I read the, the article title in JAMA, should patients have access to their laboratory tests? What? What do you mean it's their laboratory test? Why shouldn't they have access? How could this question be asked in 2012? How about this? The AMA is lobbying the government that no individual in this country should have a right to their DNA data unless it's mediated through a doctor. And interestingly, they did, the AMA, their own survey of 10,000 doctors, and 90% said they were totally uncomfortable using any genomic information with their patients. So, I mean, this is amazing. I had a very spirited discussion with the head of the AMA the other day who wasn't too pleased that I'm questioning their self-serving policy. And how about this one? Should, should patients have access to their office notes? Oh my gosh, they might see SOB and think the doctor's calling them an SOB instead of the meaning shortness of breath. Oh my gosh. So we now have this emergence of citizen scientists because this is a world where information is now getting to be a level playing field. That is, when you digitize human beings, it isn't in the a domain of the doctors only. It's now in the smartphone or in the genome sequence, and this is a real turning point. This is a change of the equilibrium or the, however way you want to describe it, the comfort zone of, of uh, physicians of today. So now we even have things like ALS patients who are concocting their own drug because they can't wait for their care provided through their physicians and they're working through patients like me to organize clinical trials themselves and, in fact, publishing on things like lithium effects in, in ALS. And it's really striking. Some of the best clinical trials recently published uh, from groups like patients like me or 23andMe. So I want to just wrap up. We have old medicine today still unfortunately. But with these digital uh, features of this pervasive connectivity and ever-expanding bandwidth, the internet, social networking, and super and cloud computing, and on top of that, wireless sensors, genomics, imaging like a portable ultrasound and many others to come, and our information systems, HIT systems, we have the super convergence, the likes of which we have never seen before. And that really does set up this creative destruction, this movement, which I think is going to be largely mediated through the public because the medical community so far is not exhibiting the capability of the change that's needed to adapt to this new world. And so that is a world of precision medicine where patients are fully or much more participatory. And we even have ability to prevent things like heart attack in the future or uh, type 1 diabetes because we have five years to, to be able to monitor the uh, attacks on the islet cells of the pancreas. This is a really exciting uh, future uh, of medicine that can be uh, had if we take the initiative. So I'll just leave you with this thought. Uh, I do think the future is extraordinarily uh, bright and I'm very appreciative of being here at Baylor and so much for your attention. Thank you.